When we think of post-traumatic stress disorder, many of us immediately think of psychotherapy. Trauma-focused psychotherapy. Reliving the trauma, processing emotions. But what if I told you that jumping straight into therapy could, in some cases, do more harm than good? PTSD is not a single condition. It's a spectrum of neurobiological disruptions that occurs subsequent to trauma exposure, affecting perception, activity, cognition, emotional and reward experiences along with sleep disturbance. And therefore, treating PTSD optimally requires an understanding of these broader disruptions. Today, we're gonna to explore why psychotherapy is not always the first or only answer in PTSD management. Welcome to Psychiatry Simplified. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. If you're interested in all things psychiatry, mental health, and neuroscience related, then this is the channel for you. So don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay in touch with all our future releases. The first key aspect we have to recognize is that PTSD is heterogeneous. Different subtypes, different needs. So what we can see here is two phenotypes. We've got the emotional undermodulation phenotype that gives the hyperarousal subtype. This happens because of a reduced prefrontal cortex inhibition of the arousal parts. And therefore there is excessive driver of arousal from the amygdala pathways. So this is why we get a hyper arousal subtype, which requires a different approach from the PTSD and dissociative subtype. Here we have emotional overmodulation. Here, the prefrontal cortex has an excessive inhibition of the emotional pathways and thereby here the individual presents with depersonalization, derealization and dissociation. So this subtype here, the neurotransmitters that are involved, we have opioidergic pathways, particularly kappa opioids, along with endocannabinoid dysregulation. The key to recognize is that when we have the dissociative subtype, there is a different strategy compared to a arousal, hyper arousal subtype where we can use medications to reduce arousal. If we use these same medications in purely the dissociative subtype, here these patients can worsen. For clinicians, you can explore the trauma curriculum that we have in the academy. As you can see, the slide is part of one of the courses, so you can explore it in the complex post-traumatic stress disorder course and the post-traumatic stress disorder course. Now imagine prescribing trauma-focused psychotherapy like prolonged exposure to someone with significant hyperarousal. This does not mean that exposure therapies can't be applied. Having said that, it's important to recognize the stage that the individual is in and that's what we'll see in just a bit here what happens is if we apply prolonged exposure to an individual with significant hyper arousal where the prefrontal cortex is really struggling it can't control the arousal parts what happens here is that through this exposure there is going to be a greater amygdala load therefore there's going to be overactivation of these fear circuits which might not just make therapy ineffective it could effectively re-traumatize them. Similarly, a dissociative patient might shut down completely, unable to engage. So recognizing these nuances forms the cornerstone of effective post-traumatic stress disorder treatment. The second point, understanding the staging model. Right intervention, right time. Now you can see this image here that encompasses the staging model. So I've written a review on the advances in understanding post-traumatic stress disorder here, and you can explore this on psychscenehub.com. The stages in post-traumatic stress disorder move from zero at risk to four, severe chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. And what we'll see here is as the individual moves towards chronic post-traumatic stress disorder, stage three, stage four, there are neurobiological changes. For example, worsening of the prefrontal cortex functioning or heightened allostatic load along with neuroinflammation, significant sleep disturbances, the onset of depressive ruminations and cognitions, 
What this means is there is a greater possibility of comorbidity that's happening here. So effective post-traumatic stress disorder management follows a staging model which aligns the treatment with the patient's current state. For example, at stage zero, at risk, patients may show no symptoms yet and may benefit from preventative measures like mindfulness or psychoeducation. Stage one to two, early stabilization is key. Again, they might not need proactive psychotherapy or medication, but they may need a focus on sleep regulation. Now this can be done through either CBTI, but in some individuals, if there is REM hyperarousal, they may need medication here. One has to reduce the autonomic hyperactivity and provide basic safety. Stage four, however, is very different. Here, a multimodal approach may be needed, where we might need to address sleep through noradrenergic antagonists, such as clonidine or prazosin, and or we may need to strengthen the frontostriatal circuits. This can be done through either neuromodulation or through medication as well. So for example, adrenergic dysregulation may necessitate medications like prazosin to reduce nightmares and hyperarousal before the individual can then move towards either trauma-focused psychotherapy or before we examine the cognitive and the activity dimensions. If they're struggling, we can then target those appropriately through neuromodulation or other dopaminergic nor adrenergic potentiators. We've also got to recognize that individuals may have comorbidities, neuroinflammation, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, and these need to also be taken into account. Point three, hypervigilance and sleep disruption. The therapy barriers. We know that the basic stress response for all human beings is passivity and anxiety as a default mammalian response. And what that means is when there is constant stressor or trauma, or a heightened allostatic load, many patients will develop amygdala hyperactivation. This can be conceptualized along the allostatic load model. Here, there is a persistent overactivation of the brain's fear circuitry. This expresses itself in the form of hypervigilance, feeling on edge, startling easily. This is driven by the amygdala, which connects to the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which provides a value judgment on what we experience and the insula, which is responsible for interoception. It interprets what we are experiencing. And this, of course, amplifies fear responses along with emotional distress. But there's another piece to this puzzle, sleep disturbances. You see, when sleep disturbances are there, and particularly when the amygdala is activated, there is excessive noradrenergic activity. We know excessive noradrenergic activity results in restless REM sleep. Restless REM sleep results in ongoing increase in noradrenergic activation because restful REM sleep requires a phenomenon known as noradrenergic timeout or noradrenergic silencing. I've written an article on the neuropsychiatry of sleep here where I've covered this in detail. Of course, in the academy, we have the precision sleep medicine course where one can explore that in much greater detail. You see, REM sleep is crucial for processing emotional memories. Here, fragmented REM sleep perpetuates hyperarousal. It impacts on the ability to process traumatic memories in a restful state. But importantly, fragmented REM sleep impacts on the emotional tone the following day, whereby the individual is in a state of constant alarm. In these cases, before engaging in psychotherapy, interventions to restore sleep, whether pharmacological like prazosin or clonidine, or behavioral like sleep hygiene practices are essential to lay the groundwork for therapy. Here, we must recognize that if psychological interventions to improve sleep aren't working, it becomes crucial to consider psychopharmacological interventions because without adequate sleep, it becomes really, really difficult to improve all those other functions that we want to improve in this individual. Sleep first, forms the basis of all psychiatric treatment and I would say all treatment in medicine as well. We often think of sleep as just process C, circadian, or process S, homeostatic. Sleep is actually a form of emotional regulation. Sleep helps us regulate better, but it also reflects poor emotional regulation. Number four, ignoring 
Phenomenology is a recipe for harm. Failure to recognize the specific phenomenology of PTSD can lead to severe consequences. For example, in dissociative patients, exposure-based therapy without grounding techniques risks further emotional disconnection. Similarly, in patients with significant hyperarousal, cognitive interventions without stabilizing autonomic hyperactivity can heighten fear responses. Similarly, if an individual has intrusive thoughts and images, flashbacks related to trauma, along with other intrusion phenomenon such as ruminations of a negative nature, what's happening here is they have intrusions related to trauma, along with intrusions that are pointing towards a depressive rumination. In other words, we must now consider how to treat the depressive ruminations as well. Here, feelings of guilt or worthlessness or hopelessness require consideration of the dimensions of activity, cognition, and reward, i.e. depressive dimensions, along with the treatment of PTSD. Similarly, if an individual has racing thoughts, crowded thoughts, along with hypervigilance, here now they may be moving higher up the mesolimbic hierarchy. So therefore, simply focusing on psychotherapy or simply prescribing an SSRI may actually worsen individuals because what they're pointing to is racing thoughts is often an indicator of a mixed affective state. So we can see phenomenology is crucial because phenomenology will be linked to appropriate treatment. And number five, multimodal management. Psychotherapy is part of the whole. PTSD is not a disorder that can be solved often, especially in the severe cases with a single intervention. Here, we look at a multi-pronged approach along with a longitudinal approach. Effective management requires a multimodal approach. So pharmacotherapy may include SSRIs, but we must know when we've got to move away from SSRIs to broad spectrum antidepressants or broad spectrum agents. Similarly, we have alpha-1 antagonists like prazosin. We have alpha-2 presynaptic agonists like clonidine. Knowing when to use it and how to use it becomes extremely crucial. Or emerging therapies like ketamine. But we have patients where ketamine is prescribed and they may worsen. Knowing why this happens is important because the worsening with ketamine tells us that we've not looked after the arousal pathways. Similarly, neuromodulation becomes important, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation. But often what happens is transcranial magnetic stimulation may increase migraine, may increase tinnitus, may worsen the flashbacks, may result in heightened arousal, may result in side effects. Again, this tells us that we've not looked after the arousal parts. So always think about the frontostriatal limbic connection. And remember that trauma has resulted in a significant activation of the emotional and fear circuits. So we must look after these. Then psychotherapy, trauma-focused psychotherapy. When introduced at the right time, therapy can consolidate gains and help patients reframe their narratives. But many a time we find in clinical practice that when individuals' cognition, activity dimensions, and reward sensitivity improves, they may say, at this point in time, I don't want to engage in exposure therapy or trauma-focused psychotherapy. I want to consider supportive treatments because I want to engage with one, two, or three activities. They may want simply relationship counseling to enhance the interpersonal bonding. They may come back to exposure therapy later in the future. So this phase-oriented therapy, which is an evidence-based approach, becomes crucial to managing post-traumatic stress disorder. We have emerging treatments like MDMA, assisted psychotherapy, ketamine, as I mentioned, and we have lots of other treatments on the horizon. So for example, we have stellate ganglion block, but knowing when to apply this becomes more important than the treatment itself. What I find in clinical practice often, it's how we use these treatments that's most important because evidence informs, guidelines guide, but clinicians think. And the thinking encompasses the patient characteristics, the patient phase with the appropriate neurobiology, the understanding of the psychological principles, and then utilizing the tools 
to improve patient function. So to summarize, PTSD is not just a psychological condition. It does not mean that psychotherapy is first or the only treatment. It's a disorder of the brain, the body, and the mind. Psychotherapy remains a vital tool, but only when used as part of a tailored, phased approach that respects the patient's unique neurobiology and stage of illness and recovery. If you'd like to explore this in more depth, I've written a detailed article on this topic, which you can find on Psych Scene Hub here. It dives into the science, the nuances, and the future of PTSD management. Similarly, if you want to engage in a structured course through case studies, through quizzes, then you can explore the academy courses, the trauma curriculum, where we have complex PTSD and PTSD. So I hope that you found this video useful. If you liked it, don't forget to leave us a like and remember to subscribe for more science-backed insights. And of course, let's continue simplifying the complex together. A big thank you to all of you for supporting this channel. I really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.